Lord Carnarvon was the first to die, just four months after the opening of the tomb. He was soon followed by the American financier George Gould, a member of the royal family Prince Ali Kamel Fami Bey, and the other members of the expedition. One by one, every year, 22 in total. All these people had one thing in common. They all participated in the opening of the tomb of Tutankhamun and his closest relatives. Apart from the legends about the curse of the pharaoh, the cause of most of the mysterious deaths was attributed to grave mold, which for many millennia waited for its chance to germinate in the lungs of the careless explorers. But in this video, you'll see why this is not just some silly old myth, and mold still remains a serious contender for the destruction of all mankind. Before you is a Viserum polycephalum, or more simply, slime mold. Formally, all this is just one cell with many nuclei. It extends its thin, scouting tentacles in search of food, and then moves its mass closer to the food in order to grow and develop. It claims living space, organizes the construction of colonies, creates highways, connects resource depots, the endless web of its empire is planned as if by the best engineers of mankind. For example, like the city of Tokyo. In laboratory conditions, it shows the ability to learn, memorize, and even transmit information to other still inexperienced relatives. This substance is able to independently find a way out of a labyrinth and move toward food choosing the shortest possible path in doing so. The most frightening thing is that this type of mold simply does not have a brain, and we don't understand at all how it makes decisions and plans its actions. And if tomorrow, Fiserum decides that the laboratory assistants themselves are more nutritious than their oatmeal, a real apocalypse on our entire planet may not be far behind and possibly in the entire solar system. Marta Cortesau of the German Aerospace Center in Cologne irradiated the fungus Aspergillus niger with large doses of radiation. During the experiment, it was confirmed that the fungus is able to survive in space, receiving a dose of radiation 200 times greater than the lethal level for humans. With such resistance, it's not surprising that while dinosaurs have long disappeared, even though 200 million years ago they walked on mold, but hundreds of thousands of species of fungi continue to develop and thrive. And these are not only laboratory experiments. What you see here is one of the control units of the Mir space station. The mold just gobbled up all the insulation of its wiring. It caused the unit to fail and disrupted the space station's communications with Earth. So, if Elon Musk forgot a piece of French cheese with mold in his orbital Tesla, in the struggle for survival between the car and mold, I would bet on a living, albeit completely alien to us, organism. But some molds have gone even further. They not only perfectly tolerate lethal doses of radiation, but have also learned to eat it. This was confirmed by an experiment with the fungus Cladosporium spherospermum, which took place on the International Space Station for 30 days. It turned out that this species is capable of performing radiosynthesis and converting gamma radiation into chemical energy for its nutrition and reproduction. And researchers from the universities of Stanford and North Carolina said that a new type of fungus that appeared in Chernobyl blocks radiation and may become a solution to protect astronauts from radiation doses during interplanetary travel. A mold layer of just 1.7 millimeters reduces the dose rate of gamma radiation by 5%. So, 
fungi can crawl, learn, feed on doses of radiation that are lethal for all living things, survive in a complete vacuum at zero humidity, and move around in spaceships. Perhaps, having long seized our home planet, they're just waiting for a chance to colonize the solar system, and the first mold on spaceships will just act as scouts researchers who pave the way for the coming expansion. Mold has learned to live on bare stone, on metal and concrete, in plastic and diesel. But today, fungi still need organic acids, protein compounds, sugar or cellulose to feed them, and one can imagine that they are not yet going to the moon or Mars. But as soon as mankind begins to truly colonize near space and create space bases, there's no doubt that we will be doing this together with mold. And it's unlikely that it's going to do little more than cover cheese and salami there. No, it will destroy building structures and poison the air with spores. The problem is, whether you like it or not, mold is already everywhere in your everyday life. For example, all of you are familiar with Aspergillus fumigatus, which is found on fruits and vegetables or on damp building structures. In these places, the surface quickly becomes covered with a fluffy, dark bloom. The spores of this fungus can grow on any nutrient medium, including your lungs. You inhale up to a billion mold spores every day. But this does not lead to the development of any disease, if your immune system is working in your body's defense. However, if your immune system is weakened, spores will grow in your lungs, leading to the development of invasive aspergillosis. A growing fungus in search of food forms into a whole network of mycelium in your body. Thin filaments spread that overtake internal cavities and organs. Aspergillosis progresses rapidly, causing shortness of breath, cough, <coughs> <coughs> sorry, chest pain. An infectious process that begins in the lungs spreads to neighboring organs. The fungus captures them one by one and takes them over for its needs, obtaining resources for its further growth. The toxins released by many types of mold act at the level of your body's DNA stimulating the activity of cancer cells. It's no coincidence that in countries such as Kenya and Ethiopia, liver cancer is three times more common than in France. But even if you live in a developed country, be aware that even the main types of common apartment mold emit about a hundred toxic compounds that provoke and develop cancer. And with regular ingestion, even in small quantities, there's a high probability that aflatoxin exposure will sooner or later lead to liver cancer. And in fact, this is not all. It's believed that there are from 100 to 250,000, and according to some estimates, up to one and a half million species of fungi on Earth. Obviously, in developed countries, sanitary control, a high level of medicine, and your own healthy immunity are still on the defensive. But we've already seen how a fungus can think, learn, and adapt to any environment. This means that they might observe the behavior of viruses and decide that it's time to mutate. Today, we can't even protect a spaceship from mold. But tomorrow, entire cities, countries, and continents will need protection. The forest will take over block by block, street by street, squeezing people to the outskirts. Respirators will be our companions for years to come. Operational brigades with poison sprayers and flamethrowers will burn the perimeter of areas that are still held by humans. Of course, in the world of the coming apocalypse, the development of new drugs and treatments will be of decisive importance. Artificial intelligence will help develop revolutionary drugs, medical robots will perform operations, and nanoparticles will conduct examinations and deliver drugs directly to 
the desired organ. Preventive diagnostics, obligatory for everyone, using tumor markers of new generations will help to identify oncological diseases in the early stages. But not only yourself will have to be protected, the planet's atmosphere will be poisoned by poisonous spores. They'll destroy crops and livestock, and then neither respirators nor the latest medical advances will save you from hunger. However, all this may not happen for one simple reason. Perhaps the fungi will turn out to be even smarter than we can imagine. Now, all that you have learned about their mortal danger will seem like child's play. An innocent joke. After all, it may turn out that fungi don't really need this whole war. Why would they destroy those whose minds can be controlled, who can be subdued and used for their own purposes like zombies? Click on the next video and find out if this is possible.